much, John. It's an honor to be speaking to this audience, and I'm happy to be here. All right, so some of the things I'm going to go over have been ably and perhaps better covered in the earlier talks, but I couldn't change all my slides on the fly. <laughs> but one of the most important things I want to get across to you is that in California, it's easiest for, easy for us to think that tobacco is over, that we no longer really have to worry about secondhand smoke, Prevalence, cigarette smoking uh, prevalence in the United States has dropped radically since peak, exp you know, peak use rates in you know, the 1960s and 1970s. This is an old graph, but I like it because it shows you know, real, you know, like how environment and, and funding and policy and political action affect us. And here we are now down at around 1,082 cigarettes per annum. Um, in 2014, that's our latest data. So the United States is looking great, and when I do studies in California, a lot of people who are second non-smokers come in with uh, like 20 to 50 percent of my subjects come in with undetectable levels of nicotine metabolites in their blood, but that and in their urine. That's not the whole story at all, because you you know California is just California. Then there's the rest of the world. This is consumption by region, by year. And what's going wrong in the world is not that tobacco control isn't working. Global prevalence has actually gone from about 16% of the total world population to about 14% of the total world population between 1980 and 2012 or 13. However, the population has increased. So the actual total cigarette consumption has increased. It's about 5 trillion cigarettes annually now. And that's 1.8 in developed countries and 4.4 in developing countries. And what's going on in China is that not only do you have still, you know, actually prevalence is dropping in China um, among men, but it's rising among women. And everybody's gotten um, more disposable income than they did in 1980. So people are buying and smoking a lot more cigarettes per capita. This is still killing, secondhand smoke exposure is killing 600,000 people a year in the world. And um, even in the United States, it's not over yet. This is data from the CDC from 2011 and 2013. 25% of smokers are still exposed to secondhand smoke. They come in with detectable levels of codeine, a metabolite of nicotine in their urine. And if you live in multi-unit housing, that is to say an apartment, a condo, townhome, that's higher. If you're a kid, it's higher. And if you're African American and a kid, it's 70%. And I see this at, in my work at San Francisco General Hospital. I used to study non-smokers. Now I'm also studying smokers, and they are poor. And they are um, low education, and they are in groups that just have a lot are socially burdened and have high rates of other substance use. Globally, this is you know a different cut of different data. The WHO just splits you into either you're 15 or you're old, old, older than 15. But you can see that more women are exposed than men and that again, we still have tons and tons of children being exposed in the world. Now, there are a lot of ways of looking at um, disease caused by secondhand smoke, but I just mechanistically like to look at the difference between the atypical fraction for active use, where you have about 30% to, uh, you know, one-third to cancer, one-third to respiratory disease, and one-third to cardiovascular disease, uh, of which that third, 62%, is just heart disease, other is, is coronary heart disease, and then there's other kinds of cardiovascular disease. With non-smokers, 85% of the smoking attributable mortality is due to cardiovascular disease. So we're really looking at different mechanisms for cancer and for cardiovascular disease. And we're looking at people, we're seeing that people are sensitive, much more sensitive in their cardiovasculature than they are to, you know, to cancer. You're seeing effects at lower doses and you're seeing them rapidly. So I'm just going to review terminology and talk a little tiny bit about cigarette smoke. This is rough and this is after the smoke is mixed with air, but it's about 90% gases and 10% um, semi-volatile organic compounds. That's our particles. 
Unlike a diesel particle, you're less likely to be seeing a carbon core, and you're more likely, there are, there are solid particles, but you're more likely to see things that are really droplets of oils and waxes, the kind of brown, crappy stuff that sticks to walls or collects on filter membranes. Terminology-wise, when I say side stream, I mean the smoke coming from the burning tip, the cigarette between puffs, mainstream is what the smoker inhales. Now, you've already seen this graph, but what I want to really point out here is, again, that we're desperately sensitive to particles and that cardiovascular disease um, doesn't grow, go up in a linear way with dose. It goes, it, it's exponential. So, you, you know, the particle concentration can go up exponentially, and you're still seeing relatively modest increases in disease. So you're really sensitive. John? I just point out the x-axis is logarithmic here. Yes, it is. It's very low. <laughs> yes. No. So it's the same graph that other people have shown. So, um, and here is something, you know, in another way that John showed, but just that there are multiple mechanisms that contribute to vascular disease. And... Um, that is thrombogenesis, sympathetic neural activation, endothelial function, oxidative stress, and inflammation. It's just a simpler version of John's very complicated graph with fewer arrows running between the parts. I'm going to be <laughs> focusing, but all the arrows are still really there. I just, <laughs> I'm going to be focusing on endothelial function, but endothelial function happens in a context of inflammation, oxidative stress, and thrombogenesis is extremely important. So again, here's your endothelium, lining every single blood vessel down to your capillaries. It's six times 10 to the 13th cells. It has a huge surface area. Its basic surface is, you know, properties when it's healthy is anti-stick, anti-clot, and it secretes nitric oxide, which allows your vasculature to change dynamically in response to physical changes. This is the kind of healthy, integrated system that keeps you from fainting when you stand up or you're hungry. Just normal, complex, but simple functioning. Now, cardiovascular disease traditionally has been thought of as a blocked pipe. And occlusive cardiovascular disease is a significant part of cardiovascular disease, just not having enough blood flow to an area because you've developed a big wad of atherosclerotic plaque plaque on the side of the vessel. But mechanistically, there's other stuff that happens. And it's atherosclerotic pla plaques, you know, they start, it's a process. And it starts with the kind of endothelial dysfunction that we measure through flow media dilation. And it proceeds to um, beginning to get monocytes, uh, it's secreting chemokines, changing cell surface pre proteins, binding the monocytes, having the monocytes go through the, um, the layer of the endothelium into the underlying uh, smooth muscle cells in the basement membrane. And then you get uptake of lipids, and you have your, um, your uh, monocytes turning into macrophages and eating up lipids and turning into foam cells and dying. And you have disruption of the smooth muscle cells, migration in of um, fibroblasts. And these are blood vessels. This thing, I mean, it's in some ways like a freaky tumor. <laughs> it's, it's not that simple, but it's, a very, it's, it's actually a complex tissue, and it can develop necrotic centers. And the really important part is that this whole seal on the top of it can break, and then it can either just stimulate uh, clot formation by exposure of the basement membrane and all of these underlying things that are decidedly not nonstick, or you can also have like these blood vessels bleeding out. And so when you're looking at cardiovascular disease, you're looking at mechanisms where you can either have a clot forming somewhere in your central arteries, because normally we think mostly of atherosclerosis forming on your arteries, you know, the high pressure vessels, having a, um, a fragment of plaque either stop you right there or, or a clot stop you right there or have it be thrown off and lodge further out, like up in your brain or down in your leg for peripheral arterial disease. I'm not going to stick here very long, but it isn't just heart disease. Vascular disease affects pretty much every tissue in your body one way or another. And you've also seen this. This is our favorite measure. I'm working with people. 
in the Human Exposure Laboratory, and this was our first study, the first one I participated on with cigarette smoke. I was uh, running the cigarette smoking machine inside the exposure chamber, wearing a clean air supply. But um, what we showed here um, was that just a 30 minute expo sorry, <laughs> just a 30 minute exposure to uh, 350 micrograms per cubic meter of cigarette, fresh cigarette smoke substantially inhibited flow mediated dilation and that we have to see a little bit, saw a little bit of a rebound at 24 hours. We still don't know the significance of that. We saw some other things too. So it also, the endothelium shed a lot of cellular debris into the blood. It, um, when we took a blood sample and purified the circulating repel, the population of repair cells, your endothelial progenitor cells, they were different after you'd been exposed to smoke. So this is the kind of difference that can persist after a single exposure. Um, they multiplied more, but they were less able to migrate in a gradient of what's normally a chemoattractant for them. We would put them on the top of a filter membrane, chemoattractant on the bottom in a tissue culture dish, and they just sit there instead of crawling through the holes in the filter membrane. And we also saw some increases in the concentration of circulating vascular endothelial growth factor. We'll see about that. So I did another study with another fine young cardiologist. And in this one, we were actually using cigarette smoke that had been aged. And I'll show you more about my system for aging cigarette smoke. But there's a lot of chemical changes that occur when you put smoke into the air. And most of what you're breathing is secondhand smoke, mm -hmm. is smoke that's been put into the air. You're not leaning over the ashtray so much. And what was important about this study is that we have the concentration and we still were seeing statistically significant effects on flow media dilation. And there was also really no thresh evidence of a threshold effect but like that, that we were going to come down to a safe exposure level. Further iteration of the idea that even very small amounts of, of particular material. Here, I mean like, this is a, an immediate effect that we can measure in a healthy human being. This is different than being able to see an effect between 10 and 20 micrograms in a population that includes sick people. This is something I can do in the laboratory in an hour. And flammated dilation, Clint, I didn't mention this, but it's actually an excellent predictor of your risk of myocardial infarction and of other uh, cardiovascular diseases. So when your flammated dilation is down, you are at much greater risk of having cardiovascular disease events. So my conclusions about secondhand smoke are very small changes in particle concentrations in the air have very large health effects. Combustion particle exposure has a nonlinear dose response and the vascular disease affects more than the heart. Now, let's take a minute and go out to something else. I'm gonna talk next about other kinds of exposure from secondhand smoke. So Bogart and um, Ingrid Bergman, she smoked too, but I just show him. So secondhand smoke exposure is her breathing his smoke from the air. But there are other things going on anytime you smoke in a room. You will have sorption of a fraction of the chemicals, that is to say the semi-volatile organic compounds or the tar, just in a very shorthand, to indoor surfaces where they then desorb and you can be exposed to them. And the tricky thing about this is that it extends your exposure period. It is a, only a subset of the chemicals, but once you've smoked, they're there in your environment. So what is third hand smoke? We break it down to the three R's, just like reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's remaining, um, it's the chemicals that remain on surfaces and in house dust that are able to re-emit in some fraction back into the gas phase so you can breathe them. And that while they're hanging out there on surfaces, on dust, in the air, they react with other chemicals in the environment to make new chemicals. So, um, Again, where do these things stick? Every single room surface, every single part of you. That's why people smell of smoke after they've been around smokers. Um, and again, it's the, tar, it's the tar that doesn't get removed by ventilation. The semi-volatile organic compounds, air exchange in normal rooms is actually quite slow. Around you, it takes about two hours for all of the air to change over on average. You've got a window open and a stiff breeze, it can be much faster. But that's the average across residences for 24 hour period is two hours. Um, so not only do the things stick to the surface, but they absorb into porous materials where they form a secondary sink. I've done studies and other people have done studies 
where you expose a material to smoke repeatedly and you never see it saturate. It just keeps sucking it in and sucking it in. You don't see a change in how much deposits. And then, um, of course, tar contains nicotine, nitrosamines, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Not good stuff. And persistence increases your exposure time. Now, this is something I found in the laboratory. In my laboratory, I'll show you what I saw. Other people have done similar experiments and seen similar results. So this is a normal day in my laboratory. You turn on the cigarette smoking machine. It uh, takes a while and you come up to a steady state concentration. But we started sometimes noticing this, which is to say before we turned on the smoking machine, if we turned on the clean air first, pushing through the smoke aging chamber, and I'll show you a picture of this in a minute, we would see this peak, you know, what the heck? Science has its ways. So when we started just uh, smoking the day before and turning on the air and we were finding particles coming out of our system. We reproduced this uh, experiment by just taking a piece of carpet that had been exposed to cigarette smoke and putting it in a tiny stainless steel box, leaving it overnight and checking the particle concentration when we pumped air through in the morning. Still see particles. Lauren Petrick and her colleagues did an experiment where they took nicotine sorbed onto um, paper and exposed it to ozone at low concentrations and they saw formation of particles. It didn't work for them with nitric oxides and it was also humidity dependent. This is a complex chemical reaction but essentially it's the formation of secondary organic aerosol particles we think. It also may be coagulation and things going on with particles that are already there, but we see half the particles drop out in just um, 30 minutes in the chamber. So I think this is a dance of things coming on and off the surfaces and particles nucleating, particles coagulating, a lot of interesting chemistry, but the idea is that if you're in a room where people have smoked for a long time, you may be exposed to <laughs> elevated levels of fine particles. Particle size measured by a scanning mobility particle sizer and condensation nucleation was larger than for secondhand smoke. In secondhand smoke, I see between 90 and 120 nanometers with thirdhand smoke particles at 22 hours after smoking. I saw 140 to 160 nanometers. These are still nanometers, small, fine particles. So what's my system look like? Well, again, I set it up to generate secondhand smoke that was realistic. So we have a smoking machine, a clean air supply, and this big stainless steel chamber at six cubic meters. That's about two telephone booths worth. And it's got baffles and fans, and it's got a fabric and wallboard in it. And um, I recruit people off of Craigslist, consent them, warn them what they're getting into, and they have a respiratory exposure to cigarette smoke through a Tyvek hood that's part of a, a, a pressurized air purifying respirator. However, as my particle, third hand smoke particle experiment showed, I'm actually also created a third hand smoke exposure uh, system where if I let the smoke sit overnight and then run clean air through the system, I have another kind of particle that will come out. And when you breathe that particle, your concentration, your urinary concentration of the metabolite of nicotine known as codeine increases. So this is an exposure. Now, the particle um, concentration drops rapidly as you push clean air through the aging chamber. But there, if you were imagining an occupational scenario of someone coming in to clean a casino or a hotel room or a bar where smoking has happened, they're going to have an expo you know, could have a very high particle exposure when they open the door. And if you're living in a room that was formerly occupied by a smoker, it is quite possible that you have elevated levels of exposure to particles. And how much time have I got right now? I've got, excellent, I'm going to need it because I've got an incredibly complicated slide from my colleagues at San Diego State University who went into um, 112 low-income housing units in San Diego County and measured nicotine just on the surface of the walls. They took a standardized cutout a template and wiped with ethanol with a little bit of vinegar in it um, so that they could pick up nicotine. 
without having the nicotine evaporate. And then they analyzed the specimens and calculated the amount of nicotine per, cube, per, per square meter. Now, um, the colors of the individual, each bar represents a home. The colors represent people. The blue is smoke, people with smoking bands. The light blue is a smoking band, I mean, sorry, that's green. Um, smoking band with past smoking um, greater than thir three years ago. And dark green is a policy where people who visit can smoke. And um, that's the non-smoking residents. Smoking residents are red or beige for either they smoke in their home or they don't smoke in their home, but they smoke outside. And what this is the level of detection. So only as um, a small fraction um, actually were below the level of detection. And um, these, this set over here are typical San Diego non-smoker concentrations from previous studies, also mostly conducted in low-income housing, but some across the economic spectrum. Here are people who have um, one, greater than one microgram per square meter. And um, this is actually an interventional study where if you have more than three micrograms per meter, they're going to come in with a cleaning service and clean the living daylights out of your house and then resample. I'm not presenting that data. But um, here's her median nicotine uh, concentration is two micrograms per square meter. But what I'd like you to look at is that um, here's the people who are two-fold higher. Here's the people who are five-fold higher. And this, again, I'm always working on these logarithmic scales. And um, here's the people who are tenfold higher. And here's the really creepy part um, where you have people who are no longer smokers and who's, who don't even, you know, who they, they're either former smokers or they moved into a home that they happened to know someone had smoked in in the past. But it was more than three years ago. And we're still seeing a subpopulation of homes. And this just represents, no, not your average exposure, but it represents how smoke in a room that's been smoked in a lot can persist for years. York refers to these homes as saturated. And um, I won't be spoiling too much by saying that the preliminary data from the cleaning intervention is that it has no effect. So scrubbing the heck out of the walls, first with simple green and then with vinegar and water, and steam cleaning the carpets and steam cleaning the mattresses and vacuuming every bit of the dust that you can get out of there. You know, a $2,000 cleaning job on a given one to three bedroom apartment doesn't have a statistically significant effect on the nicotine that can then be recovered one day later by wiping the walls. And let's see. So our actual <laughs> concentrations here. So my conclusions are, again, about 10% of the smoke of every cigarette has the potential to linger for a very extended period indoors, if you're smoking indoors. The components in third head cigarette smoke are toxic and carcinogenic. I didn't even talk about my data showing that nicotine reacts with normal ambient oxidants in the, in the air to form NNK the tobacco-specific carcinogen. I also have data from an analysis of tobacco industry documents that I admitted in the interests of time that shows that um, while nicotine in, a, in, in an environment can decline over time, it looked like NNK did not. And they went out to 110 days in that experiment performed at Philip Morris. It was a pilot, so you know we'll only give it so much credit. but. Other data I have shows that third-hand smoke releases formaldehyde for protracted periods of time. I've exposed pieces of paper to smoke and given them to Mohamed Sliman when he was at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs to do headspace analysis. And headspace measures the chemicals that are volatile and evaporating off of something, go into a, a, a gas, the paretograph, mass spec, mass spec. And you see acetonitrile, which seems to be a signature for third-hand smoke in very high abundance, and you see a bunch of other volatiles. But the creepy thing is that when you take that piece of paper, sit it on a bench, you know, out of harm's way in my laboratory where it's not exposed to smoke for 42 days, and stick that piece of paper in the headspace, you're still seeing stuff coming off of it. 
And I think it's because of active chemical reactions, because I think by 42 days, the formaldehyde from cigarette smoke would have evaporated from a piece of paper. So um, these are my take homes. And we know for sure, I haven't been able to measure <coughs> cardiovascular effects. I don't know, just don't have the funding to third-hand cigarette smoke. But I think that given that we know from epidemiological studies that even tiny changes in ambient particle concentrations affect your health. I do think it is reasonable to say that if you live in a heavily polluted, polluted um, house where somebody smoked for years, um, even if you paint the walls, even if you clean it, you are probably still going to be exposed to a lot of chemicals from smoke because they persist. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so her talk is open for questions or comments. I'm sure that there will be some. Your question. Oh, so I was wondering, so after you do the cleaning and we think it's clean, are those at levels where if you walked into the room and it's still smell like someone had been smoking? Not necessarily, no. Unfortunately, especially as smoke ages longer and longer in situ, it may lose that characteristic stank that most of us, you know, would, you know, say, oh God, you know, that's, somebody just smoked here. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on and the volatiles that you can smell, I think, begin to change over time. It's an, it's an experiment that hasn't been done. This is just, again, my own perception from having been in places where people smoked a long time ago and from what York said about these homes where people hadn't smoked in three years. Any other questions? Yes. I think, um, let's say in a clean home, uh, over time, uh, there's dust settled. And you think that the compounds that they absorb into the, the surfaces can get into those particles in the nutrient train? Yes, there is an ambient background level of nicotine in the air. It's quite low. You need to sample for a long time periods and have good sensitive equipment to detect it in ambient air. But even some homes where no one has ever smoked, can have nicotine detectable in the dust. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not so worried about that. That's, you know, thousands of times below the levels of nicotine we see in the home of a former smoker. That's just part of our lives, you know, and part of our history. Ha you know, here in terms, and I'm just gonna speak briefly about policy. In California, we just got a change to the real estate disclosure. It's just a simple checkbox. Has anybody smoked in this home before? And that, I think, is huge, and I want that nationally. It's just if, you know, and not everybody ever knows, and we don't have any commercially viable tests where you can wipe a wall and get a nicotine measurement. That's still in the realm of academia and government, and I have tons of people email me asking about that. But that's one of the things I hope to get done. Julia. It makes me wonder too about the occupational exposure of workers in bars or restaurants where the yeah. use smoking is banned now. Uh, yes, it's there. If you, you know that bar was smoked in for 50 years, <laughs> and they still haven't bothered to change the color. <laughs> At some bars, I, I've been. Other bars are much tidier. It's there, and also we're going to soon be. Um, collaborating with a local cannabis dispensary and hopefully measuring the emissions from aerosolized marijuana in situ and doing some dust and surface wipes just to see what their occupational exposure is. You know, and what, because it, you know, if you're in a dispensary, people are handling this extremely high THC material, grooming the, the buds and, you know, there's all kinds of dust and everything like that. You know, they're, they know what they're into, but at the same time, they may not know about the terpenes evaporating and forming secondary organic aerosols. Marijuana has plenty of terpenes. That's the limonene, uh, the myrcene, these chemicals that, again, are really like to form you. You give them a little oxidant and bam, they have nucleated a particle. So, and that's something I don't think the medical marijuana community is thinking about yet. They're actually adding terpenes to... Uh, marijuana extracts to make them fluid enough to work well in a in a in a cannabis e cig or you know vape pack. 
and they're concerned, you know, they're interested in the medicinal properties of terpenes, which may be true. But this is this is the perspective we bring. Any more questions? I don't want to stand between you and your food. Yes, uh, Sue John. Uh, oh, sorry. What, you. What you. Are your findings generalizing with the other types of particles that might be deposited in houses? I'm thinking in this case of the elucidating gas leak, where we found a lot of evidence that there was particle deposition and a couple of people that are continuing to get sick. Um, yes. Um, to be honest with you, this is something that's always at the back of my mind when I'm reading about uh, field sampling in public places, because people mm -hmm. don't just smoke cigarettes, they also cook, this, and they you know, sometimes use god-awful amounts of room deodorizers and Febreze. You know, smoking, if you're actively smoking in a room, that's always your biggest worry, because, you know, people smoke more than they cook. Most people do, if they are actually smoking and smoking in their houses. And so, you know, you're really able to get very high exposure levels and a lot of stuff out in there. But the room, you know, I mean, it's like, we know we're just taking, you know, this little tiny spectrum of chemicals and measuring for them. Other people are looking at other things, and, you know, part of my work is to try and get out there and to, you know, talk to people who are looking at those other things. Just as I'm trying to get, you know, I hope to be able to get people in dispensaries to think about particulate air pollution and, you know, indoor air contamination. Sue John, you had a question? Last one. Yeah, just curious, you know, do you have smokers or you know, those who just smoke? Because you can smell mm -hmm. from the person. So is there any study uh, from exposure from the person? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, this is actually, this is where third-hand smoke science came from. Now, very early on, chemists noticed that nicotine sorbs wildly. You've got a nice stainless steel chamber, you put nicotine into it, and it vanishes. Kathy's published on it, other people have published on it. And unfortunately, there it languished, except, you know, I mean, like, there was a, there's a small nucleus of people who knew this was going on, knew it was a factor, but the health implications didn't, you know, the right people just didn't take it seriously in the health community. Then York Mott in San Diego was doing these studies of cessation in poor people. This is where his, this incredibly difficult work of getting poor people to let you come into their houses and do weird things. That's how he's able to do it. So he's been doing this for decades and it started with cessation and it started with noticing that even when smokers quit, or even when they only smoked outdoors and they were very honorable about it, their children had elevated levels of cotiny. And then there was the smokers move out, non-smokers move in study, where they did this crazy difficult study where they went in and measured nicotine on surfaces in a smoker's room, just a house, but just before they moved and measured urine in their family for cotiny. And then they recruited the people who moved into the home after they left and looked at them and compared them to people who'd moved into the homes of non-smokers and saw an intermediate level of exposure to nicotine in the people who were non-smokers moving into a home previously occupied by a smoker. It's not as much as living with a smoker. I am never claiming that. Third-hand smoke is not the same as second-hand smoke exposure. It's lower and longer. But that's how we, that's how the science emerged was very obviously if you're touching it and it's on you. And there's a new study, I'm sorry to wander on so much, but there's a new study in an ICU wiping surfaces and if a mom smokes and comes to visit her sick neonate in the ICU, there's nicotine all over the place in the ICU. If she's a non-smoker, there isn't. Now this is partly because they're not enforcing their hand washing <laughs> policies, but partly just because it's all over someone's body, every single part of their body. It's in the air and it just lands on everything and then absorbs on so, every porous surface. I think we'll stop there. Something in the air. <laughs> Something in the air. <laughs>